the CNMR described in terms of energy levels or vectors. Uh, if you really want to go further and understand what happens when two or more spins interact, you need to learn something about quantum mechanics. So the goal of this lecture is to sort of talk about some of the basics of quantum mechanics and how it applies to NMR. This corresponds to the first half of Chapter 6 in Jim Keller's book, uh, Understanding NMR Spectroscopy. So if you're um, taking the class, this is the one to watch for that, um, that lecture. One of the first ideas for NMR is this idea of an operator. An operator is just a mathematical rule for transforming one function into another. So for example, an operator might be the derivative with respect to x of a function. Uh, so if we say, if we operate on x squared plus 3e e to the x with the differential operator, uh, we would get 2x plus e to the, or 3 times e to the x as the transformed product. Another idea is that um, there are functions that if we operate on them, we get the original function back times a constant. And those are called eigenfunctions. And the ones that we're usually interested in are the wave function, we denote by this symbol psi. And if we have something that we, we can operate on a function and get the function back times a constant, the constant is actually uh, given a name also. It's called the eigenvalue. That's the constant term we apply, we obtain when we operate on, on an eigenfunction. So an example we often see in quantum mechanics is the operator that's the energy operator. And we use this one because spectroscopy usually involves energy transitions. The energy operator is called the Hamiltonian. And its eigenfunctions are the energy. The constant terms are the energy. If we're going to talk about wave functions as eigenfunctions, you should probably be aware there's a shorthand that's often used. And it's just something invented by Paul Dirac, where if we say we want to talk about the ith wave function, uh, we can usually write it with this little um, symbol around it called a bra. Uh, and that's commonly done. Or if we use its complex conjugate, we call it a ket. And it's usually in, uh, written with the bracket on the, at the pointy end towards the left side. And if we uh, write these together, this implies that we integrate over all space. So rather than writing this integration like that, we usually just draw these, the cat and the bra together. And we can write it either with the size symbols in there or just with the subscripts in there. And this one that's all together is called a, a bracket, since it's a bra and a cat that's been put together. It's notable to uh, recall that if we draw it this other way, with the regular function times the complex, con complex conjugate, that does not imply integration. That's just a multiplication of functions. So keep that in mind when we do this. Another behavior that uh, these um, wave functions have is if we multiply two of the same wave functions together and get one, the wave functions are said to be normalized. If we multiply two of the, or integrate two of the wave functions over all space and get zero, the wave functions are said to be orthogonal. And usually we like um, wave functions that have these two properties. They're called orthonormal functions. One of the interesting things about quantum mechanics is if we take a single measurement, we don't always get the same results. So if we take two measurements over time, because the uh, outcomes are based on probability, we, the measurement result will vary. So it's better to look for an average value, and this is often called the expectation value. And it's given by this equation written below. And if we look at the energy operator, the Hamiltonian, uh, we just say we take the integral of the the complex conjugate of the wave function times the Hamiltonian times the wave function we integrate over all space. And the term in the denominator is just the normalization factor. So if we normalize the function, we put the denominator in there. And again, this is called the expectation value and it's the average value of the function. And we prefer this because we don't want variable results, we want an average result. So we talked a lot about wave functions and Hamiltonians and how we use them to get energy values, but what are these wave functions and Hamiltonians for one nucleus? Well, the wave function is usually written as a sum of all the different states that a, a spin can be in. So in the case of one spin, it can be either, either be aligned with the field or against the field. So these two states are called alpha and beta. And we just say we have some weighting of alpha and some weighting of beta. We call these the C terms. 
and the Hamiltonian is just given in terms of this operator iz and it's just the Larmor frequency times iz or we could write it in terms of the uh, gamma b0 iz which is the same thing as Larmor frequency so if we say um, well if we just said that iz was an operator how does it operate well here's the important eigenfunctions that we need to keep in mind iz applied to alpha gives one half times alpha so it's giving the function back so yeah the function the eigenfunction back times a constant so it's an eigenfunction and then iz on beta equals minus a half beta and those are two that we need to remember so if we, if we said what if we said uh, a Hamiltonian, as we've written it above, is applied to alpha? Well, we just saw that iz on alpha is going to be one half alpha, and iz on the constant term del armor frequency omega zero is not it's, it's a constant, so it doesn't operate on it, so it just comes out in front of the iz term. So Hamiltonian on alpha gives one half um, times armor frequency times the um, alpha function, and we can also write these functions involving x and y angular momentum. In this case, these functions are not eigenfunctions, they're just functions. So if we have ix on alpha equals one half beta, ix on beta is one half alpha, iy on alpha is i halves beta, and iy on beta is negative i halves alpha. So those are important things to remember too if you want to um, make sure we can function, get expectation values and things like that. So let's try putting all this together and see if we can actually do a problem. What is iz? And if you want to try this before you look, go ahead and give it a try and then you can move on. But let's just um, move through this right now so those of you that want to see can, can watch this. Now that the, these brackets on the side of iz mean an expectation value, and if we expand it, this is the wave function times the iz operator times the wave function, and the one on the left is the complex conjugate. And we know what the wave function is. It's going to be c alpha times alpha plus c beta times beta. In other words, the two functions that are possible for one spin times their weightings, which are the uh, c terms. And we can put that in above, and we get this. If we go ahead and take the iz operator and, and apply it to the things on its right, uh, we get this term down below. Uh, the iz only applies to alpha. The c alpha is a constant term, so an operator on a constant does nothing, so we just take that out. And likewise for iz on beta, the beta terms comes out, we only operate on beta. And we just saw on the prior slide what iz on alpha was and what iz on beta was. So we can write those out. And the term on the left is 1 half c alpha alpha minus 1 half c beta beta. And now we just have this uh, four term expression and we can just multiply it out. Just like using the FOIL method that you learn in college algebra and get four terms out of this. And here are the four terms. And if you look at these carefully and re remember this idea of orthogonality or normality, we can actually say um, two of the terms are equal to one when we integrate them over all space, and two are equal to zero. Two are normalized and two are orthogonal. So we can knock out the zero terms and get a little bit of a simplified expression here, and it just uh, tells us that iz is one half c alpha star c alpha minus a half c beta star c beta. And how we interpret this is we say, uh, the first term is the pro uh, this c alpha star alpha is the probability that we're going to obtain one half as an eigenvalue, so it varies between zero and one. And likewise for the c beta star c beta term, that's the probability of obtaining minus a half as an eigenvalue. So you may be wondering as we're going along here, why are we talking about angular momentum? Why is angular momentum so important? What we really want to talk about is magnetization. We're, this is what we detect in our um, in a Mark coil. Why are we talking about angular momentum? And the reason why is that uh, the magnetization is the sum of all magnetic moments in there, and the magnetic moments are um, given by the angular momentum. So if we understand what the angular momentum is, we can actually calculate the magnetization. Here I've just shown what it is for the z component, uh, and we get similar expressions for x and y can get a little further on this if we recall that iz is going given in terms of these two probabilities and we can put it in the expression above um, and what we'll find is that there's n of these terms each spin has a slightly different probability um, the cicj terms so we end up having to add all of the spins up so we get n of these and um, 
so we can think of it this way, but if we put the IZ in there, we actually get a bunch of these terms um, in terms of each. Uh, like I said, because the outcomes vary, because the probabilities vary for each individual spin, we have to add them all up. And if we add all of them up, uh, they all have a one half in there, so we can take that out front. And um, we would get the C alpha star C alpha minus C beta star C beta each time. And if we added them all up and divided by the number of observations, that's the average. So we drew the bar over it because it's um, the average one for all nuclei. But that implies that we've added them all up and divided by n. Well, if we divide by n, we've changed the equation. So we also have to multiply by n to keep it the same. So if we're going to use the average, we have this term 1 half gamma n times the average term. And we know that that uh, 1 half times that average term is just the IZ on the average. So we, now we get the uh, magnetization in terms of the angular momentum. So if we can actually calculate the angular momentum, we can actually we can calculate the thing that we're interested in and that we can observe the magnetization. And by similar reasoning, we can get magnetization for x and the magnetization in the y direction. This is very useful after pulses where we create x and y magnetization. And I think that's as far as we should go this time around. Uh, next lecture will continue and show what you do with these.